So now I want to I want to introduce uh, Dwight Detter of Whole Foods Market. He'll be moderating uh, this panel on the the local ag supply chain. Um, hold on. Dwight has spent over 20 years in the grocery industry, and he's been with Whole Foods for 14 years now, right? Yeah. And then uh, as, a, as a local forager for the past couple of years, he's been helping startups and small farms get onto the grocery shelves at uh, Whole Foods Market. And uh, he's currently involved in developing a value-added program with um, the Archie's Acres VSAT program, and you heard from Colin earlier. And I'll let uh, Dwight take it from here and introduce you to the panelists. Thank you. All right, terrific, thank you. Um, I would like to introduce our great uh, panelists here. We have uh, Sharon Ketch, Erica Block, Eric, the proud provider of the food. Yeah. So we can all try to stay awake after that delivery. <laughs> and then Lucy, and I'm gonna go ahead and let, let you each introduce yourselves. Great. Um, hi everyone. So as Dwight said, I'm Sharon Check, and I'm with the Urban and Environmental Policy Institute at Occidental College, which is a mouthful, so we call it UEPI for short. And I work on the Regional Food Systems program there. And currently, our primary project that we are working on is looking into the feasibility of a food hub that would be located in the Northeast Los Angeles Riverfront District, which is a group of five communities along the Glendale Narrows section of the LA River. Um, and the goals of this project are not only to work with, um, with small-scale regional farmers and improve food access, but also uh, with a particular focus on job creation and economic development. <clears throat> and our study is scheduled to be completed in uh, January or February of this year, or of 2014. Hi, my name is Eric Oberholzer, and I'm the founder of Tender Greens. Uh, you tasted a little bit of that today. Uh, hopefully it was good. Thank you. Um, and, the, and the idea when we started with Tender Greens was really to uh, democratize slow food. Uh, what I mean by that is, you know, for much of my career, I was a chef in the in the luxury market, um, feeding the one percent or what we used to call the newly wed or nearly dead crowd, and uh, and then on my my day off, uh, I couldn't afford to go to the restaurants that uh, I was part of, uh, and the restaurants I could afford uh, really didn't speak to my uh, lifestyle or food philosophy. So I found myself shopping at the farmer's market, Santa Monica Seafoods, Whole Foods was a big part of that. Um, and we wanted to create something that really gave you the same food experience and um, sort of political peace of mind that you have when you shop the, uh, the market or, or shop at Whole Foods um, and take it home and, and prepare it with some, some skill. Um, knowing that most people don't know how to shop, they know even less about uh, cooking, we, we thought maybe there was a, an opportunity for Tender Greens to fill a gap. Um, seven years later, we have 12 restaurants and we're growing and uh, it seems uh, there's a need for this, uh, uh, you know, slow food with uh, accessible price points and service styles. So. We're, uh, we're continuing to grow, but you know the challenges are um, foraging for, for the best products at, uh, at a price that we can afford and, um, and that farmers can bring to us. Thanks. Hi, uh, I'm Erica Block. I'm the founder and CEO of Local Orbit. And Local Orbit is a technology startup. And, and what we've done is we've built a platform that's designed to support all the really interesting aggregation and new distribution models that are happening around the country and really around the world. And so, so rather than trying to build a marketplace online, what we've done is we said, look, there's all this innovation that's happening with producer co-ops, food hubs, farmers markets that are trying, that are starting to expand to wholesale. Um, the independent distributor, the girl with the truck who picks up from farms and delivers to restaurant, they all are, are solving on a local level with regional characteristics the local supply chain problem, but nobody's built business management tools that help them operate more efficiently. 
And so that's what we've done. And, and really, though, actually, what I'll say is what we really help people do is tell their stories. And fundamentally, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, we look at a su supply chains as stories. And what we try to do is make sure that the right person gets the right story at the right time so the right thing happens. And, and that's, that's really what it comes down to. Lucy Norris from the Northwest Agriculture Business Center. I came in from Seattle. Uh, my region is pretty much Northwest Washington, including all the island counties. Um, it's, uh, we have a lot of farms that are considered small scale. Um, we'll talk about economic deterrence a little bit later, but uh, there are a lot of economic deterrence when it comes to small scale agriculture in Washington. Um, but there's a big market in the mouth of Seattle and uh, not that many very robust and profitable opportunities for farmers other than farmers markets, traditional CSA models and that sort of thing to reach uh, institutional customers uh, at universities, hospitals, or even uh, Head Start programs that do um, you know, feeding for 1,500 kids a day in low-income neighborhoods. Um, so we've developed with our farmer um, participants this last, well, we've been working on it for a couple of years, trying various models, but that we're about to finish off our first year of a food hub uh, of decentralized farm aggregation sites that collaborate uh, and share resources such as cold and freezer storage, delivery trucks, and marketing. And one of my jobs is, um, is really sort of developing a lot of those communication channels, working with the system uh, to make sure that all of uh, the products get from farm to market in a safe and affordable and efficient way that's not only good for the customer, but it's uh, very good for the farmer. I just will say that Lucy is actually working with Local Orbit and has been one of the early um, sort of pilot uh, sites for us. So she's actually, her farms have helped shape the platform quite a bit as well. Nice plug. <laughs> Lucy, uh, if you could start us off, uh, like each of you to, and we'll just move down to the line coming back this way, defining local. We hear local, we talk about local. What, what is local to, your, to you and your organization? Yeah, I'm glad that, it's, that it doesn't have a national definition because in where I live, local is, it's really subjective. People on San Juan Island think local is San Juan Island. Uh, it takes an hour to get by ferry to, from the island to the mainland, and there is also businesses. There's grocery stores and co-ops on the island. There's bed and breakfast and a big tourist scene. But local to someone in Seattle might also include the whole state of Washington. You know, as someone in uh, you know Vancouver, Washington might think local is down through Salem, Oregon. So it's you know the boundaries are sort of where your specific infrastructure can make it. Um, possible for you to market your product or have access to products. So when I used to work in market research and local could be anything from Parmigiano Reggiano, it's, it's made somewhere in a local community, but it's nowhere near where I am, but it's still considered a, you know, a location, a place where people are and traditions are, are maintained. But to me, it, it really has more to do with um, access to um, to our farmland and, and the market that would um, provide them the revenue. Um, also, I would say there's no hard and fast definition and, and really local is a combination of things. It, it, it's whatever's the closest possible sustainable product for wherever you live and, and that can mean a variety of different things. But I really think also, we, somebody talked about it this morning in terms of local as a philosophy. It, it, to me, local is about transparency and knowing the provenance of the food, knowing who produces the food. And so that seems to be the, apart from, it's not 50 or 100 miles or within your state, it's knowing where it comes from that defines local for most of the folks we work with. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, particularly because uh, one, the travel time for the farmer or the product isn't that far. And equally important is that, um, you know, we can go and, and, and walk the farm, see what their practices are like, and, and that tells you a lot about their, uh, their growing philosophies or, or their animal husband, husbandry. So I'm almost disappointed this wasn't a more controversial question. Um, I, our organization also very intentionally does not define local. 
Um, and we also, we work on, in the regional food systems program on the supply side, um, and I think I, I didn't mention before that our organization has a uh, over 15 year background in farm to school programming. Um, so what we really emphasize on the demand side is, as Erica was saying, transparency. Um, so that buyers can make informed decisions about exactly where their food and their products are coming from. And then on the supply side, with, with the buyers that we work with, we try to help them to uh, frame criteria that makes the most sense for them, uh, given whatever community they're in. I like it. Every year, the definition changes and broadens a bit. You know, it started within the 50-mile club to the 100-mile club to a regional food shed, you know, so it's, it's kind of within the focus. What I've always used with my group <clears throat> is when I talk to people, when I'm in San Diego, local is to San Diego. When I'm in Orange County, local is uh, San Diego, Orange County, Riverside, and Los Angeles. And then when I'm here in Los Angeles, local is California. So it's really, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a customer's perspective. So it really comes down to, to, to the transparency. Knowing, knowing where things are coming from and what they stand for seems to be a unified thought. So, <clears throat> Sharon, what do you think the, the, the greatest challenge is, and we'll keep using that bad marketing word local now, but uh, in bringing <laughs> local to the mainstream? So I would say that this really depends on whether you're including farm size in, and kind of lumping that into local. Um, especially in Southern California, just because it's, it's local, that's also uh, mainstream, big industrial scale agriculture in, in many cases. Um, and I think that those present very different challenges. So if you're, if you're looking at small and mid-sized growers, then you're, you're looking at a whole host of, of barriers and challenges. Um, and if you're not, and you're just looking at the concept of local as, as geography, um, I would emphasize education. Um, I think from, from our perspective and in, in the work that we do, um, I think that customers knowing why a local product is better, uh, where a product comes from, and then also having a sense of what their values are around local is, is probably the biggest challenge. And I'll throw the same thing to you, Eric. We talked about it and we listened to, uh, Chris mentioned a, a little bit about this question uh, at, the, at the last uh, group of what, what, are, what are your greatest challenges? Uh, I think the, the biggest challenge is logistics on, on, the, uh, on the plant side. You know, some of these farms are just too small to, uh, to get their products to the market, so we have to go to them, whether it's a farmer's market or um, bundling uh, their products on, on other trucks that we uh, try and drive by, but that takes a little bit of organization. Um, and then for, you know, some of the, the smaller ranchers uh, getting to the, their animals to, to, a, to a processor, uh, it's a big deal. There aren't, there aren't a lot in, uh, in California, and, and those that um, do exist uh, for the small ranchers, it's, it's more of a, a headache to run their 20 animals through the, the plant than, uh, than it is, you know, 4,000 head of cattle or, or pigs. Um, so it, it adds a lot of cost and, and a lot of trouble for these, these guys. And, and Lucy, what, what are some economic effects? Yeah, I mean, and like I mentioned earlier, the, the cost of farming in Washington, especially in Western Washington, east, uh, west of the mountains, is really expensive. Uh, farmland is um, definitely being gobbled up and uh, there's a lot of development. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, to bear the cost of production uh, all the way through marketing and distributing as an independent farmer without sort of collaborating with your neighbors and trying to figure out how you can share resources and all that, if you haven't, it, it, some of the biggest deterrents are really cultural. <laughs> you know, sort of seeing your neighbor as a competitor rather than a collaborator or a potential partner and understanding I've got a truck and you've got a, you know, a salad washer, you know, or maybe you have some insight into how to get GAP certification and I'm just starting that auditing process. 
Um, maybe it's an access to capital type of thing, or maybe they're trying to get into value-added product development and they don't really have the understanding of what it takes to get a you know, product developed from what you grow into the marketplace and some of those special challenges. So NABC does provide a lot of that technical assistance, but we are a small nonprofit. There's only about eight of us, and we've hired well you know, people that have run processing facilities and uh, people from the WSDA who really understand regulation. But the new deterrent uh, is now now that we're developing these food hubs in what I call the Wild West, where we don't have a lot of rules and we don't really fit into any special, you know, permitting, you know, we're basically just going by the book as it is, but Food Safety Modernization Act and HACCP planning for all the farms and some standardization, that's what we're coming up against and there will be quite a bit of uh, financial cost to these farms as they're shifting markets, you know. So they're shifting markets, they're experimenting, they're taking on a lot of risk as it is, but food safety is that next phase where they'll have to spend even more. And on that same note, Erica, you know, could you talk about some, some economic benefits as well as, as deterrence. what deterrence, but first yes. with, with, within the collaboration, you know, because it's, it's something new. The word is, is being spoken quite a bit now of, of the collaborative efforts between the group in order to make this successful. Yeah. So, so, just, so the first thing is that the, we've talked about the, the economic benefits of buying local. So the first thing is just fundamentally there's something that in the sort of local economy movement called the multiplier effect. And, and, and it's pretty much known that a dollar spent on, you know, on a local business, at a local business, yields a greater economic return to the community than a, than a dollar spent on a business that's headquartered in another state or another region. So what that means is if I go spend my money buying from a farmer, if I live, if I give my money to Lucy and we live near each other, Lucy's going to spend that money locally and she's going to hire service providers locally and so the, and the tax base is going to be improved based on spending the money in our communities. Whereas if I go spend my, if I give my money to Dwight who lives seven states over, then you're going to probably spend more of that money where you're based. And so that, so that's sort of the, the economic impact. And so I come from Michigan and, and agriculture has actually been the only growing market through the recession and which has been amazing. And actually this a, 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 a government that isn't inclined to provide grant funding or support anything is really putting money into food hubs and local food systems because they understand what value we have. And one of the things that we talk about a lot is that most, you know, do you know that Michigan, by the way, has the second most diverse agricultural output after California? The majority of the product, though, goes out for processing. So potatoes go to Lay's and apples go to Mott's and some of them go into like Gerber, which is in, in Michigan. But, but if you can keep the value of those products within the local markets or to smaller scale value added producers who keep more of the, that money in the state, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna realize a lot more economic impact. So in that sense, there, it, it's really significant in terms of building healthier communities and, 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 and creating jobs. The, the deterrence, so, you know, I'll talk, I mean, you can talk about a lot of deterrence, but one of the perceived deterrence, which we've talked about at lunch, is price for buyers. They think local's more expensive. And I think that in order for people to uh, feel more comfortable buying locally, and let's just say it's a chef, who is sourcing for a restaurant or a group of restaurants, there, there's a way to think about buying that heirloom tomato versus the sort of bland you know, tomato that comes from 2,000 miles away um, in that what you need to do to that tomato to, to make it really good for your, for your diners is a lot less and ultimately can be more cost effective. And then you also have to look on a per item seasonal basis what you're gonna spend on in-season produce versus uh, produce that's not in season and, and, and look at your cost structures more holistically. And I think we, uh, you can't just do item for item comparison. You have to look at all of the inputs and all of the costs that go into running, particularly a restaurant or a food service business. And, and we, we actually focus a lot more on these wholesale markets. So I think it's a perception that cost is a deterrent. But I think if we really start to be able to communicate and educate people, it's, it's actually less of a deterrent than we think. 
Eric, when you're, when you're sourcing food, and I'm thinking of you know, our last panel, we had a number of urban growers here. Is, is what sort of things are you going to go in and look for? What, what, what are key important issues? You know, packaging, we had mentioned HACCP, GAP certification, and, and, and standards in terms of you're buying a produce. Do things have to meet certain sizes or? Yeah, I, I think, well, the key is it has to taste good, right? It has to be a great product. Um, but beyond that, uh, we look at the growing practices. Uh, are they using any pesticides? Uh, are they organic or uh, beyond organic? Um, what is their, what is their, um, their business philosophy? Uh, are they taking care of their, their people? Are they participating in the community? And are they using, yeah, certainly uh, safe farming practices? We, we want to make sure that there's no risk of, uh, of illness in any way in any of our restaurants. Um, and, you know, a big part for me is I, I have to like them. You know, I have to connect with all of the farmers and feel as though these are people I want to partner with, not just do business with. So I don't see it as a, 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 a vendor customer relationship, I, I see it as a partnership. And in that way, um, you know, I think John Mackey talked about this in, in his book, um, you know, there, there has to be a, a win-win uh, at every stage of the, the, the food chain. And if you develop a friendship and a partnership with, uh, with your farmers, your ranchers, your artisans, um, it's, a, it's, it's a much longer, uh, more honest um, experience. So, Sharon, um, when sourcing food, you're, you're working on a, a, the feasibility of, of creating a specific food hub here in Los Angeles. So, what's important? What are some of the things, such as labor practices, food safety, packaging, and so on? What, what's, right. what's key? Well, in a lot of the, the previous work that we do with, with farm to institution programming and things like that, um, a lot of the time, food safety uh, ends up being you know, the, the front runner in terms of, of importance. Um, in the work that we do, we're trying to shift that a little bit, um, not to say that, that, um, that that's not a valid concern in, in institutions, um, but we really want to emphasize um, food that is locally produced um, by small and mid-sized farmers with sustainable growing practices, fair labor practices, and ideally, if possible, um, producers and, and uh, supply chain partners that are interested in promoting our values of food access. Um, so that's a lot to ask. It's not something, it's, it's something that we are also interested in, in working with everyone where they are, but that's the conversation that we're trying to promote. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> Lucy, I'm thinking about the proposition uh, for the uh, transparency and labeling that it uh, mm -hmm. ended mm. sourly. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about how important um, <laughs> it is to have a like-minded uh, value system. Yeah, um, you know, this was actually a funny part of our startup because we had a benevolent benefactor that um, was able to give us one of our first refrigerated trucks and then she wanted to convert it to reclaim biodiesel and uh, you know, it's a great uh, reefer truck and, you know, really helped us because we, when we first started, we didn't have delivery. People had to come to the hub, so it really hindered growth, um, even with all the quality attributes that we can offer in our products. But the like-mindedness kind of went a little too far, <laughs> like way over the top with, you know, well, they could provide delivery, but they couldn't have their coolers on overnight or their freezers on overnight and they didn't want to pay staff to be there to make sure that when the delivery driver came in that they could do all their checks and everything and I thought why because you don't want to keep the coolers and freezers on and like waste energy well to us it wasn't wasting energy it was actually helping the farmers get their products to market and save farmland ultimately was our value and that we as as an organization, Northwest Agriculture Business Center, I, I wear my NABC hat, we serve all farms, whether or not they're conventional, 
80% spray free, you know, uh, better than organic, certified organic, whatever they are, we want to be inclusive because I feel like there's a market for that and that there are target consumers where you can say, okay, well, this product, what are you looking for? What are, what are the things that you value? Okay, we're going to match you with some farms that can meet those needs, whether or not that's price or whether or not that's biodynamic farm methods. Um, we're inclusive in our food hub. Um, that may change because the majority of the farmers that are selling products are um, what are considered better than organic. They may have organic certification, but they're really the, the products that we see are selling across the board, not just with the high-end restaurants, but with our institutional buyers. They're going for the cleaner product, and they want that transparency. So the farms that are more conventional have not been doing as well in our food hub, and I think that it was just a quality attribute that rose naturally in the marketplace. So we see that there's more opportunity for the clean or organic um, growers, the ones that are very uh, conscientious. And um, so I think that's exciting. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, that's to me, the values are also about a shift in seeing the community of farming, whether or not it's just the farms in your county or whether or not it's a dairy producer versus a vegetable producer or a grain producer or a rancher, they're all, they're all using land, they're all using resources, they're all trying to capture you know, the same mouths. And typically it's been mine. And I'm not gonna share anything of why, why I'm a success. And now it's more, hey, if I don't do this, I'm gonna lose my farm. If I don't collaborate, my little farm isn't gonna survive. So I better collaborate, and I better get with the more collaborative efforts, whether or not it's a full co-op or looking like a co-op, acting like a co-op, and not calling yourself a co-op, but it's more collaborative marketing, even if it's a market co-op. Um, so I think that that's, it's really about farmland preservation ultimately, but sharing resources among your community of farmers instead of seeing each other's competitors. Just to sort of to add to that, one of the things you had actually asked about collaboration, which I, I don't think I addressed as much before. So obviously a benefit of collaboration is you have shared resources, both financial resources, um, physical infrastructure that can be leveraged and shared, and, and shared knowledge. And that was a big part of the conversation this morning. And, and so we're watching networks of people come together to collaborate, but fundamentally they're all based on the shared value of giving the farmer the, the, the biggest share of the final dollar mm -hmm. in the transaction. And so that, for, so it becomes about the farm and the, 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 which is land preservation, which is healthy food, which is small business. And so where that, where those networks bring in questions of sustainability and all the labeling that you attach to people is really regionally specific. It's crop specific. I mean, if you've got networks of folks that do a lot of stone fruit, those are very different questions from a production perspective than doing hoop house greens. And so I think really that the, the core is just really preserving, farmer, pres preserving farmlands and um, supporting farms and keeping their brand and their story at the fore rather than getting lost in the commodity market. Could you continue on with the uh, talk about that in relation to the quote food hub? <laughs> My favorite, my favorite term that I've fought for years against, and I give up. But Some, sometimes I keep thinking easier. of you know of, of of a center you know a wheel yeah. that everything goes back in. But anyway, what what what's the greater meaning at this point? I mean, I think to, so. Again, a food hub is 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 a central place, whether that's a physical or a, a virtual central location where people who are connected through business perspective, for trading networks in this context, come together and there's some sort of aggregation, there's something that deals typically with logistics, there's communication, there's some kind of um, streamlining of financial processes, and that can be, you know, it, it's interesting because we support some nonprofit food hubs that have gotten a lot of money to build warehouses with cold storage and truck bays and, and incubator kitchens to people who use a farmer's market day as an aggregation point for then follow on delivery to restaurants, um, to on farm hubs, to buying clubs. And so 
the physical characteristics are all really different and the players are different, but it really, I think you know, it, it, what we know is in order to compete in any business, it's not unique to food systems, is you have to find the greatest efficiency, the best collaborative networks. I mean, you look at any Fortune 100 company, they're built on collaborative business networks. And I think that people are starting to recognize that. And then the evolution of technology is providing tools that are much more accessible in the last three years to these small businesses than ever before. And if you could jump in on that also, because you've been working with this quite a while also, Sharon. Right, so I've done a, a lot of work over the past few years on food hubs, and, and to a certain extent around um, grappling with this, uh, this struggle of defining food hubs. Um, I have the official definition um, that I can that I can share with you, um, but but basically the point being is that the official definition is is fairly vague, um, and it's also intentionally vague I think because any time you try to sort of pinpoint uh, exactly what a food hub is, you'll realize there's this exception, um, and so I think that that really the defining characteristics are. Um, certainly dealing with small and mid-sized growers, um, aggregate, uh, having a component of aggregation, so bringing products together from multiple growers, um, having some kind of a hand in distribution, whether it's actually running trucks and distributing versus um, making connections to logistics and, and doing that piece. Um, and then also I think another, uh, another really important characteristic is, is marketing and marketing with a strategy that's focused on source identification, which um, Eric has been bringing up a lot as well. Um, and then I think a lot of the time it is for the purpose of reaching larger volume markets and wholesale markets and institutional markets um, that are where smaller growers are benefiting from shared services and shared infrastructure. So there's... Uh, there's a huge variety in the way and the form that these types of operations can take. Um, and some of them are businesses that have been operating for 50 years or more, and some of them are uh, brand new innovative ideas that are based on technologies that didn't exist five years ago. Thank you. So, so Eric, and, and thinking of yourself, you, you've got a regional restaurant chain. And you've put together, you know, and found existing, you know, distribution systems, but you've had to go out and you've done your own sourcing and so on. How, how do you see your relationship to this new collaborative effort of this virtual food hub that is growing around you? Or do you see relationships there? Yeah, well, I, I think the, the wholesalers do that and have done that, um, and they continue to, to really evolve. Um, you just have to pick the right the right partner on that. Um, I think where we see a, a huge need and value um, is one through reporting and transparency. And we worked a bit uh, a few years ago with real time farms, which um, aimed to map the 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 farm network for restaurants, so that it, it, in real time you could post each ingredient and it would link to to their website, so you could really. Um, sort of study where your arugula was coming from. And some people do, and some people would call us and, and question things. Um, but the other opportunity for us and, and where we see a big need is with these small producers who are a little bit too small uh, to, to, for the, the, the bigger wholesalers to, to deal with, um, but are getting started and they have special products that we want to use. Uh, so it might be Reride Ranch up in the Angeles Forest or, you know, a small uh, Drake's goat, goat cheese or whatever. Um, and, and these guys have to take all of their time and energy um, to, to, to tend to the farm. And they don't have time to go out and market. They don't have time to, to drive the product to the city. And they maybe aren't sophisticated enough to deal with Newport Meats or LA Specialty or whatever. Um, so we collaborate with them and our guys and try and uh, put them together so that it, it works for, for everyone. And um, it's, it's a heavy lift in the beginning, but it pays dividends over time for everybody because it, it gives these small guys um, access to a much broader market. Um, it, it forces them to, to, uh, to operate a little bit more uh, professionally, let's say. And, uh, and, and, and we get the product we, we need. So Erica, uh, 
continuing on with that of, of making this successful, we're, we're, we're talking about the future of, of this local and the food hub and moving forward. Um, <clears throat> what distribution and, and, and sourcing models have you worked with and have you seen that you would uh, like to, to call out? You know, I have to say that one of the things that I like the most is that there's a lot of room for diversity. And, 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 and again, so we, we had an urban ag panel today. Those are very different um, distribution questions than a rural hub. Um, and and so, so what I would say is that, that the notion of far, farmer-driven aggregators or producer co-ops, and I think producer co-ops is kind of the core of this, I think tends to have um, the, the highest success rate, partly because, it, well actually in no small part, because everybody who's part of a co-op has equivalent skin in the game. And, and there's some, you know, they're all there because their livelihoods depend on it. So what I would say is that whenever I've seen a farmer-driven co-op or similar model, that's what's most successful. Now, you always have one or two people who are driving that. And I, and I would say the other thing that I'd look at is, is just like any business, it's the entrepreneur who's leading that charge who's also going to be really critical to the success. So, so I would say it's, it's that, you know, it, it can come and it can be seeded from other kinds of organizations, but it's got, the, the ones that have had the most impact are coming from the producers first, and um, there's just really committed individuals who are building the system. And then for those co-ops prior to technology that still exist and grow, something like the Tuscarora Growers Co-op, for instance, which is one of the early leaders in, in um, they're based in Pennsylvania, they've built processes that have been handed down to people as they've come through the system. And so I think that's, that's sort of the mix of things. Same. Anyone? Yeah, I mean, I was just thinking that. about just the, the point about innovation and, and agriculture. There's, there, to me, I mean, I've, I have friends in the video game industry and the film industry and fashion industry and tech and you know, all these different sectors that I kind of brush up against and we have these conversations about innovation. Brene Brown's, you know, name starts popping up all over the place. And it's sort of like, agriculture really is. I mean, this sort of logistics, processing infrastructure, communications, culture change, uh, market, quality attributes. I mean, I worked in corporate food marketing research for three and a half years, going into grocery stores, you know, having dinner with people, going through their pantries, asking them questions about their values. I now use all that stuff that Kraft and General Mills used to pay me to do to help farms now, to understand the marketplace for their products. So whether or not they're just moving produce or cheese or value-added products, I mean, it's sort of like, it's the people that are buying your products are also, that they have a budget, and maybe they don't really tend to a budget, but they make decisions about what they're gonna, how they're gonna spend their money. And if you can capture all of the quality attributes that they're looking for in the marketplace regardless, you know, people are shopping all different types of channels for whatever it is. I mean, we had this conversation about, you know, buy your toilet paper one place, you buy your produce another place, you buy your meat another place, and people are going all over the place. And there's not just one demographic for your product. It can be all over the place. So when people say, oh, there's a limited market for local or limited market for organic, I say, no, you create that market. I mean, you can go out and find these people and, and actually say, all right, a hospital, who would have thought a food hub with small agriculture producers would be able to supply a hospital with all of their blueberries for one season through our food hub? Well, turns out they had a healthy food and health care pledge that their president signed saying that they would increase local food procurement by 20 or 30 percent that year. And they didn't have the faintest idea how they're going to do it. So little birdie told me that that was something that they were grappling with and I went in and said, we can help you solve this problem. By the way, here's the blueberry farmer. Blueberries are easy. You don't have to slice them. They freeze really well. You bake with them. You do raw. You put the raw blueberries in the, you know, I've told the stories before. You put the raw blueberries, you know, on the ice next to the Yoplait, and you've got local product in your cafeteria for the first time, and you've also bought this directly from the farm. And by the way, you can order from multiple producers 
pay one invoice and get it delivered on one truck. To me, that's competition, and we're also offsetting things that you can buy local. Now, we are not going to be able to supply your bananas and your oranges. We're in Washington. But for apples, hell, we're number one in the country for apple production. You better well be buying your apples in Washington, and you buy them from us. So, you know, that's, it's making those, you know, linkages from Susan the Blueberry Farm to the food service ma um, manager at the hospital, and you get in the door with a gateway product, and then you introduce them to more products. And oh, by the way, the squash producer breaks down that 40-pound squash into cubes, so all you have to do is cook it off into soup. You know, so there's a lot of things out there that are percolating. It's not just your typical, you know, high-end restaurants, which they're still there. But to me, I saw that as a saturated market. We went after the ones that local wasn't going after. I mean, what, you know, sort of just building off of that, what Lucy is talking about, in, in, and I'll abstract it a little bit, is, is that really there is no one model. It's ultimately the model that gives the farmer the best margin. Mm -hmm. and, and, and part of that is finding the right volume and the right pricing mix. And, and it's never going to come with one product. It mm -hmm. tends to come back to this aggregation collaboration. And, and it, it really, it all depends on the geography and who the buyers are and what the market will bear. But in the end, if you can give your, the farmer the, the best possible mar margin and make sure the farmers understand what their real margins are, because that's actually one of the biggest problems. People don't put the cost of production fully into their financial plans. Those are the ones that are going to succeed. It's the bottom line, as, as who's Thaddeus said. Is it Thaddeus or Colin said this morning? However, the hospitals, to me, I mean, the Healthy Food and Healthcare pledges came on the economic need to stop payments for MRSA <laughs> epidemics in hospitals. So what do we do? Well, let's go antibiotic. You know, we're like antibiotic resistance. Oh, maybe we're causing some problems here that's hurting our wallet. And maybe we need to start going for grass-fed beef and grass-fed dairy products and organic products and all the things that are putting all these people in our hospitals to begin with. Maybe we need to take charge of the food system that's actually costing our hospital more money and get our employees more, you know, fit and give them more access. So to me, the hospitals were like, yeah, you know, this, we got to get in there because they're ripe for this. It's an economic need for them as much as it is for the, for the farmers who are uh, working through the food hub. For their employees, but not for their customers. Actually, the employee, the, <laughs> well, if you're sick, do you want to eat, honestly? I mean, like, that's the thing. They, the more meals are served to their employees and guests than hospital patients. So yes, hospital patients do get a better quality food. Some are switching to hotel service type of uh, you know, meal, room service meals where you can pick your grass-fed beef hamburger. But, I mean, that's sort of like think about it, you know. It's early days as we yeah. keep hearing. I mean, it'll, it'll get there. So on the last, we're going to uh, move in here in a couple moments to the uh, audience questions. But the, the future, you know, we've talked about technology. And we've been talking about, as this is an ag conference, Farmer's Farm. Um, I see when I, when I go out to new technology, the new hydroponics, the new systems, I find it very interesting of, of being an older guy now of, of I go to a traditional farm and I see the farmer reaches into the ground and pulls up whatever he's growing and snaps it in half, brushes it off and goes, taste this. I'll go to a newer farm and they'll show me the computer systems and the engineering that they've done with it, you know, and then, and then later show me what they're growing. <laughs> A bit of a generalization has happened many times, but in, in, in your line of work, Eric, where do, you, where do you see technology is helping you to access the smaller farmers? Well, something that I've been really interested in recently is uh, aquaponics. Um, one, because as the economy comes back, a lot of uh, farmland is under threat again to, to you know, cul-de-sacs and and uh, McMansions, um, so we, we have lost a ha uh, habitat or the land costs are going up or there's water shortages or whatever, so a lot of, even Scarborough Farms is looking at um, vertical growing and what have you. Um, I was just in Wisconsin uh, touring some dairies and, and cheese producers, both small and, and large, and was amazed to see how much of it's automated. Um, there were, and even up at Pittman and at Mary's Chicken, uh, most of that was computer. You've probably been up there. Uh, 
you know, they, it's all robotics, um, which, you know, speaks to safety issues. Um, it, it's probably a reduction in insurance costs, which is a real problem. Um, injuries, uh, labor shortages in California. Um, so I see automation and technology as a real solution as long as there is collaboration so we don't get into manufactured food, food that looks beautiful and, and mm. it solves some problems but doesn't taste like anything, uh, which might erase all the good work we've done over the last 30 years. Um, in terms of tech, uh, whether it's real-time farms or any, any system that would, would help us uh, connect the dots, I think it's great as long as it's intuitive. Um, farmers farm, restaurateurs run restaurants, um, and they don't want to uh, read a big manual and you know on how to figure out this new technology that uh, somebody out of Silicon Valley is really excited about. Um, so it has to be very very intuitive if it's gonna uh, if it's gonna work. One last for you here, Sharon, on the food hub as as coming from uh, your your school. What what role does capital and policy? play in, in designing the future? In designing the future. Um, I just made that up to throw yeah, it Yeah, so I think that um, <laughs> those are two huge issues. Um, I think, well, it, specifically in terms of the food hub that, that we're looking into, um, w as I said, we're conducting a feasibility study. So we're really looking for a model that is long-term economically viable uh, without grant funds or anything like that. Um, any model like that, of course, is going to involve a, a quite a substantial amount of, of startup capital. Um, and so, I mean, I think that's a big question of, of not only uh, landing on a, a viable model that achieves all of our goals, um, but also figuring out uh, a sustainable funding mechanism to, to get it started. Um, in terms of policy, is there anything particularly specific about it? Well, or? just in terms of, you know, we've seen, you know, the state coming down, making it easier to, for the cities to adopt mm -hmm. urban oh, gardening, okay, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. Um, Water usage, um, LA County has a tiered system. San Diego County, everybody pays $1,800 uh, an acre foot. Yeah, there's, <clears throat> there's a couple policy issues that, that come to mind. I mean, first is, is the potential of utilizing urban agriculture and, and um, small operations. Um, and so figuring out uh, a system of, of safety certification that meets the standards of the dominant customers is, is certainly going to be um, an issue and, and in a lot of ways a policy issue. Um, another one that's that's unique to our food hub, I believe, and, and also unique to LA, is one of the models that, that we're looking into is um, rather than linking a food hub project to a retail grocery store, we're actually looking at the possibility of linking it to uh, mobile vending, including both food trucks and or sidewalk vending. Um, and sidewalk vending is currently uh, not a legal option in Los Angeles. So that's, we can't actually base our business model or our proposed business model uh, on that. But we think that there's a lot of potential, um, particularly to reach markets of folks that don't have uh, sufficient access to nutritious fresh fruits and vegetables uh, through through that mechanism. So we're, there are a lot of groups that are that are working hard um, to get a lot of these these policies changed and these laws uh, changed to make that an option. But that's that's one thing that that I think would impact the shape of the the food hub project we're making. Can I be, to be one disagreement? Like a, Absolutely, yeah. but I'll just mention to people, we're also opening up, so any questions, please line up there. We'll go right to those. It's just really quick, and I know you've been like gunning for some disagreement, oh, um, yeah. but <laughs> I actually have to say that one of the things that, that I'm seeing is that, that the requirement for lots of startup capital to get these collaborations going is actually not true. And, and I believe in feasibility planning and I believe in really strong business planning and looking at the options, but I actually think it's one of the things that's inhibited the sector is that people are not taking lean, agile, whether you call it tech influence startup practices. And no matter how good your feasibility study, the business model will change once it's launched. And if, if, if we could just get people, we're actually starting to think about how to train people to think in that direction, what you can do with a rental truck 
and you know somebody's farm doesn't cost you a lot of money once you have the sales. So it's just it's another way to think about it. Terrific. to the panel members is how do you evaluate quality when you take a look at fresh produce or meat or fish or, you know, what, what are the criteria that you folks are looking at in terms of finding a supplier that's consistently providing you the quality that you're looking for? I'll actually jump on that. You have a little one. You know, within Whole Foods, we have a huge quality standards. We have sheets and sheets for every item that's grown. It goes anywhere from flavor and taste to the amount of product that has to be thrown away within a case, um, the consistency of the product. You know, I get a case in and a case out. I get 15 cases in or two cases in. And there's, a, there's just a margin of error on there that's acceptable. Um, unfortunately or fortunately, the, the way it is, people buy with their eyes. So part of our quality standards are visually, if I'm putting it on the grocery stand, you know, for people to go there and buy. So you're going to have a lot of those kind of things. I think that, uh, you know, um, having GAP certification is going to be required from all of our grocery uh, produce vendors in a few years. So those kind of quality issues, you know, meeting, you know, the federal and the state and the county guidelines as well. Does that answer part of your question? Yeah, in, in part, mm -hmm. in part. Uh, Eric, how about you? Well, I, I think we probably have some of the same standards. Uh, um, I tend to go single source, so I find a, uh, a farmer who I like. Um, you know, for example, Scarborough Farms, they grow all of our lettuce. And that's that's it. We don't migrate um, out of out of their uh, out of their fields. Uh, so we have incredible consistency, both in price, supply, um, and, and quality. Um, and of course, we we chose them as a partner uh, because of GAP certification, their food ethics, et cetera. Um, and and we do that across the line. We we use uh, only. <coughs> two chicken providers. One is here in LA, Jadori, and the other is Mary's Chicken. Um, so we're not going out and, and bidding. And, and I walk the facilities uh, once, once a year, every farm, um, so that you know, I, I have the same experience. You know, pull it out of the ground here, brush it off, taste it. Or you know, at Mary's, where I held the, uh, the chicken that had just popped out of the eggs, and, and then you know, three hours later sat down to chicken tacos. Um, and everything in between, but you know, it becomes an, a very That's intimate. That's a fast-growing chicken. It's a, it's a, but it becomes a, you know, an intimate uh, relationship with with the whole the whole process. Lucy. Yeah, our, our uh, WSDA did a great job for several years of very aggressively. Uh, educating and training uh, farmers market vendors to display their products in a beautiful way, you know, no dirt and all that kind of stuff. They even did a lot of uh, workshops on commercial packing. So most of the producers that are attracted to Food Hub marketing uh, and sharing the resources is that they're already coming with their own um, standards that are pretty high. We do have farmers that are of varying levels beginning farms, young farms, second career, you know, people entering farming for this first time, um, farm laborers moving into farm ownership, and we have a lot of different types of farms, seasonal farms, people that are about to retire and all that. Um, and the quality is not that far off between the ones that have been doing commercial for a long time and the ones who are just getting into it. I think because we're benefiting from the resources that the state provided to educate people on how to pack and you know, just display and what a beautiful box of purple carrots should look like, you know. So we didn't have to do a lot of that. Maybe down the line we'll have to do more standardizing, you know, when we have, uh, you know, the Food Safety Modernization Act, we'll have some things that have to be, you know, really standardized. But right now everybody's got their really unique way of kind of putting some things together, and it, it just looks great. We have very few complaints on quality. Thank you I'm very gonna, much. 
Thank you. I'm going to ask the, the, we have a bit of a line here. Thank you. Thank you. This is a question for Eric. Um, as a chef, if all other things are equal, would you rather prefer to buy somebody who is certified organic or a person who is pesticide free? And why? If everything is equal? If everything else is equal. They're both local, they're both farmers, they both have all the certifications you need, they both can provide a consistent product. In your experience, would you prefer the organic certified product or the pesticide free product? And why? Well, I, I think our preference would be to go with or, or, you know, certified organic. Um, the the uh, measures are just a little stricter, so it gives one a little bit more peace of mind. That said, we don't get too caught up in organic certification um, because generally my experience is uh, uh, that the smaller farmers can't afford to go through the certification process. And that's where you know the relationship and the and the and the farm visit is really important to see that they're not spraying, they're not using pesticides, they're not using genetically modified seeds, they're not um, mistreating their animals if that's the case, or uh, you know their their fields, their soil looks healthy, uh, their work workers are happy. Um, so you know, in the case of Scarborough, they uh, they have certified organic fields and they have some that are not certified uh, because they rent all of their their farmland so they can't afford to keep bringing in um, you know inspectors to certify fields because they may they may lose them um, but the same practices are employed whether it's certified organic or not and and that's I think that's the most important thing I, I think it's a mistake uh, for consumers uh, to get too caught up in the in the certification, it's become a really slippery mm -hmm. label, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. The next, and we'll just keep these to one minute to the panelists, if I could, so we can get through the last three. Okay. Well, I have um, two questions. Uh, first question you is. You get one. Oh, one. <laughs> <laughs> mm, okay. Um, two part. <laughs> Okay, uh, <laughs> makes it a little harder. Um, well, I was gonna ask about cold chain and then the other one was gonna be about um, development of, um, of, of urban farming. Uh, what, what do you do about soil contamination in, in, in the, the Detroit area or in, in any other um, urban area where, the, where they're trying to move to local production of, of agricultural commodities? Uh, the soils or the, the things that they were doing previously in the, in the land, is, does that have any effect on, on what they can grow there or have, have there been any issues with uh, with with um, heavy metal contamination or uh, or other things? I guess that'd probably be that'd be Eric. Yeah. Eric, I mean, you, Eric, or Eric? That a little Eric. bit. You, you probably yeah. I mean, I, well, I mean, there certainly in or in Sharon Brownfield. <laughs> oh, sorry. No. She's teasing. <laughs> um, okay, certainly in in Brownfield situations, there there is a contamination issue with soil um, and urban agriculture in general. Um, but, but one thing that I think is, is very interesting is there, there is a lot of technology coming out with um, greenhouses and models for urban agriculture that is, is safe to grow on brownfields. Um, so there's, there's more coming out. It's, it's definitely an issue that uh, needs attention and there's um, m a mitigation factor that needs to be addressed. Um, but it's, it's something that is possible. And just, I know farms in Detroit that are dealing with issues, they're actually, t they tend to grow on raised beds, which is a little bit more challenging. And then people are experimenting with mycology as well, with mushrooms and decay. I mean, it's an interesting, you know, I, but it's hard, it's a hard question. But the third, the third option with that, and, and there are quite a few people doing this in Detroit. I was just at some uh, indoor farms in, in Chicago, and you can grow indoors also with, hydroponics or aquaponics, grow lights that came out of the marijuana industry. And, uh, you know, you can grow year round. So you can get local food um, in an urban environment. Um, and it, it solves some real food desert issues as well. You can activate, uh, you know, like in the case of Detroit, these old industrial zones that uh, can turn into uh, food zones and provide jobs and perhaps some, some markets as well. And I'll just, since we've all gone way over, there's some interesting things that I saw down in Orange County with grow socks down on the, uh, the, the old Marine Corps base, that they're putting these grow socks on the tarmac and growing. 
and getting organically certified. Hmm. So lots of lots of neat technology. Thank you. Hello. Yes. Um, I'm curious uh, how much thought you've given to how the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement or the TPP would affect all of your lines of work should it pass, um, because uh, you know the quality standards and consumer choice and all of the things that are so valued, like even the hospital determining they want local or if a school determines it wants more organic and non-GMO, then the TPP would allow corporations to come in and sue cities and regions and companies for doing any kind of practice that could take away their corporate profits. So I'm just curious, because this has been, you know, covertly negotiated for several years now and it's kind of coming forward. So I'm curious how much thought, um, you know, the, the different um, uh, people within sustainable agriculture have, have given to the impact it would have and what changes they might have to make, et cetera. Um, I don't think we're at the threat level. If our, if our local produce distributors are sort of keeping an eye on us but not I mean, I don't think anybody's willing to go to the point of suing. I mean, we're, we're a new concept, and a lot of people who know business look at us and go, ooh, that's kind of cool. What do you keep on going, you know? But I, I don't think that we're yet at that threat level. We're, we are still more concerned about how we're going to, you know, <laughs> comply with Food Safety Modernization Act and get all these farms, that, you know, up to snuff on their HACCP plans and make sure everybody's, you know, in compliance so we can keep doing what we're doing and grow the business. But I honestly, I, I have not looked at that yet, but I think that's a, that's a few years off. Um, Healthy Food and Healthcare, by the way, is now over 500 hospitals throughout the country. So hosp it's not just in Washington State that hospitals have signed these pledges and each hospital has their own uh, you know, goals to meet in terms of local food procurement, but it's also other things like energy efficient light bulbs and, you know, composting and all that kind of stuff. Local food procurement is just one of them. That's the one we, we tackle, but TPP is, oh, I'll look it up. Maybe Please do. Okay. okay, we shall. Um, unfortunately, we've, we've, we've went way out of our time. If you'd like to come down and ask your question to the individuals, you know, as opposed to, to sharing with the group. Thank you very much.